Um, welcome to the McDonald Center for the Space Sciences Robert M. Walker Distinguished Lecture for 2021. We're absolutely delighted to be back and meeting in person and, uh, and hybrid. And we're very appreciative to our distinguished speaker, Kevin McKeegan, for being here in person because he helps us to kick off the, uh, the series again as an in-person event. And it's really good to, to be able to get together. It's something I think we, we've almost forgotten how to do. But let me say a few words about Kevin. He comes to us from uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, where he is Distinguished Professor of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. Um, he got his undergraduate degree at St. Lawrence University. Mm -hmm. And after that, he came here to Washington University to get his PhD. He studied isotopic anomalies in cosmic dust, working with Robert M. Walker himself and with Ernst Zinner, who many of you uh, know, at least know these names. After he got his PhD, he went to Lawrence Livermore National Lab for a couple of years before settling in at UCLA in 1990. I think. I think so. Who can remember? Well, Who can, frankly? <laughs> At UCLA, he continued his study of solar system materials, looking at practically everything he could get his hands on from other objects uh, other than the Earth, and probably including Earth as well, and um, has, has really uh, made a, a huge name for himself and has done a lot for cosmochemistry and planetary science. Um, in his time there at uh, UCLA. He has run the Ion Microprobe uh, Center there. And in addition to making many great measurements, he's taken it as a, as a personal, personal item, I think, to try to improve the technique, to improve the measurements, to always be looking for better ways to do things. And in much the same way as Bob Walker came here and said, we, to, to make the measurements, we need to make great advancements we need a new instrument. We need something called a nanosims. In the same vein, Kevin said, we need a new instrument. We're looking at, gonna look at Genesis samples. We need a megasims. And so he, he went about building that and then making the measurements. And you'll hear uh, more about that, I think, today. Um, he participated as a co-investigator on the Stardust and Genesis missions. And so a lot of what he has done uh, in the years since then is to make measurements on the samples returned by those um, instruments. He has been named fellow of numerous uh, scientific societies. Um, he has had an asteroid named after him. Uh, he is the recipient of the, the 2018 J. Lawrence Smith Medal from the National Academy of Sciences for his contributions to the field of meteoritics. And he will be awarded in 2022 with the Leonard Medal, which is the highest honor of the Meteoritical Society. So it's a real pleasure for me and an honor for me to introduce Kevin this afternoon to be our Robert M. Walker Distinguished Lecturer. Kevin. Well, thank you very much, Brad, for those kind words. And I would just like to point out that asteroid McKeegan is not an Earth crosser, so <laughs> the McKeegan family will not be responsible directly for, you know, the demise of modern civilization, let's say. Yeah, but start, yes, could you try resharing? For some reason, this is not sharing on Zoom. But really, okay. Uh, <laughs> Hold on. Technology. Technology. I can try to reshare, but I, uh, let's see. While he's doing that, we had a great uh, present, presentation that he made last night at the public lecture. And as those of you who know who came to that lecture, we had to overcome some technical issues and we didn't overcome them all. It turns out the Zoom webinar is a little more difficult than the ordinary Zoom. So we'll try this one more all time right. and make right. sure it's sharing for the online. Let's see, <laughs> and how will we know that? So I've just shared it again. Yep, got it. That's okay, it. and I see a lot of people who are now on the wrong screen. <laughs> Not through no fault of their own, I think. If you want to go back over we... to Zoom. Okay, go ahead. You can, no, it's on another, uh, well, oh, can do I it see. there. Well, where did it go? Start back over. Sorry. It's hiding. 
way up in the upper left corner. Yeah, the, yeah, it's the, not the, showing. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, oh hey, look at that. Can I just drag it somewhere? Or, or, or what, hit the, I, that little bar. Yeah, that little dab. There that we go. And then drag and it all the way down. Out of the way. Nice. All right. Okay, folks, you're Perfect. gone. <laughs> Hopefully, you're still there. <laughs> but, well, thanks everybody for coming, and thanks to the people online. Sorry about uh, trying to move you off our screen so we could see. Uh, thanks, Brad, and thanks, Jan, for a uh, really great visit. I've had a great uh, couple days here. It's been a lot of fun to connect with uh, some young people that I didn't know, and some, let's say, not so young people. So, but uh, but that's been fun too, and it's. Uh, it's it, it's really everybody's been so welcoming. It really feels like a kind of a homecoming. So it's been nice nice time nice time here. So thanks for doing that. Um, now let's see if I get my mouse back over here and advance. Right? No, this is. I'm trying to click. Let's see. Okay, I'm back on the PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. So, you know, um, I'm really deeply honored to present this talk in tribute to Bob Walker, the founding director of the McDonald Center for Space Sciences and my PhD advisor, as, as, you, as you just heard. So last night I, I gave a, a public talk um, with kind of a theme of how sample science can help address big, question, big questions such as, you know, how did we get here? And by we, I mean, how did our solar system get here? How did our planet get here? And then, you know, today or last night, also reflecting on Brad's remarks, thinking about preparing this uh, seminar, I, I thought to myself, uh, well, you know, how did I get here, All right? And by that, I mean, you know, how 40 years ago, right? I was sitting in those seats or something like, Seats like those, slightly less comfortable than these ones appear to be. Um, and now I'm standing up here as a distinguished alumnus, right? So how did, how did this occur, right? And, and uh, thinking about this, the answer is really surprisingly quite straightforward and simple. It's mostly a matter of good luck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever I've managed to achieve is really directly relatable, directly attributable, to the good fortune of coming under the wing of these two great scientists, Bob Walker, Ernst Sitter, and also the timing of being here at the time uh, I helped unpack the original WashU ion probe right out here in the loading dock. And uh, that was great timing. And I actually remind myself of this regularly, right? I, this is, uh, I, I have this picture pinned on my uh, board in my office to, uh, <clears throat> you know, just, to, to remind myself of this good time. And this is what the young people, <laughs> there were no computers really in those days. You plotted results by hand on graph paper. And so Ernst is holding up the first publishable data from the 3F there, which shortly appeared in a letter to nature. Um, and you'll kind of forgive me at the time, I thought, well, this is something you do every other month or so, right? You fire off one of these letters to nature and they put it in, so. You know, things may have been a little bit different <laughs> than they are now. Um, but I also like this picture because it reminds me of what, what I really learned um, from these guys was not just some uh, skills or intricacies of mass spectrometry and so forth. It was really a question of learning and attitude. And I think that's the main thing. I, you know, as we all know, you know, doing science or in fact, doing anything that's creative and original is hard, right? And um, what these guys somehow instilled in me is that it's also fun, right? And so the joy of discovery was just uh, apparent and coming through. And, and equally important, they also managed to give a sense of optimism and a kind of confidence in the process. And I think that's, that was a really important part. And so I'm really forever grateful to uh, Washington University to James McDonald. I was a Roger Traff Chaffee astronaut fellow, which was, a, which was a great thing. And to Bob Walker and Ernst Sinner, um, you know, for, for all that they've, they've done. And uh, uh, I miss them a lot. I wish they were here. And I'm going to move on in case I get emotional now. <laughs> okay, so the subject for today, oh, and we have our 
our dots back here. Let, yep, well, let's see if I can, if I give a third talk, I'm sure we'll get it figured out by then. And we come down to the hard to read from this angle. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. One, Keep, more. one more. Ah, okay, excellent. It will go away. All right, so this isn't the Great Arch and that's not the Mississippi River. Anybody recognize this is the uh, skyline of Chicago, All right? And I like to show this because this is in my mind where the trouble starts and what we're gonna address, <laughs> take that in several different ways, I suppose. Um, what we're gonna address today is what is sort of the relationship between the waters of Lake Michigan here and the setting sun. And, and that's kind of a, a theme. Um, and in order to do that, I've got to get the mouse back over here so I can click. Okay, in order to do that, I've got to talk about, you know, physics has a standard model. You could say causal chemistry has a kind of standard model. So I'll explain what that is. And then why oxygen is the most important element in the galaxy. And uh, now we have a lot of experts here in Genesis, but so you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Genesis mission and what it involved. And uh, one of the results that I've been involved with, which was determining the oxygen isotope composition of that object there. And that, uh, so, you know, what, for, for some, this is going to be old news, but for others, it'll be something completely new. And my main goal there is to convince you that the Earth is grossly isotopically anomalous and that this is something we should care about, all right? And if you, I'll explain what that means and come up with then a few implications for where this might lead us and what the processes are. So implications for the solar nebula. Okay, so solar nebula, what, that's what cosmochemists call objects like this. Astrophysicists call this a stellar accretion disk. It's the same thing, all right? And basically from our point of view, what's important here is, right, the solar system is, is I don't know, less than a third the age of the galaxy. So everything in this, in this picture here has been through many, many generations of stars, right? And this object as it's forming from a condensing from a giant molecular cloud, you know, this, there's a lot of processes going on in here. It's all, of course, orbiting the central mass, colliding, evaporating, recondensing, th thermal processes. It's hotter in the, in the center, of course, and very cold in the peripheries. But to first approximation, you can think that this is a great, like a cosmic blender, a great homogenizing machine, right? Because you have these materials, they're, they're elements of which have been made in, 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 in stars thrown out into the interstellar medium mixed up, they come down here, they get mixed up again, they evaporate, things homogenize to a first approximation. All right, so, um, and we'll see that that is not perfect. We've known that for a long time, in fact. So here's another artist conception. Now you're inside the disc. This is a painting from Bill Hartman, a planetary scientist and, 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 and a very good artist. So, uh, What's, but this is depicting something that is fundamentally not expected and rather amazing. All right, so thanks to Jupiter achieving a sufficient mass early on and whether it stays stationary or moves, doesn't really matter. What it does is it prevents a planet from forming um, where the asteroid belt is now between Mars and Jupiter. All right, so these objects in the paintings, these are early foreign planetesimals there's still gas, you can't see it. The central object's on its way to becoming a star. And it's all in orbit and it's colliding. But these planetesimals here, never, most of them, some did, but never the grew big enough into an object to retain heat sufficiently long to melt, all right? So, so that is a key point. And what's also amazing, you know, these things you can see, they're, they're, they're not in gravitational isostatic equilibrium. Um, they've been, They've been whacked many times by collisions and, and these collisions take materials. And again, thanks to Jupiter, you have resonances in the asteroid belt and some of that material gets put onto elliptical orbits, crossing the orbits of the inner planets and occasionally falls, right? To the earth as meteorites. And 
Here you see the thumb of my friend Andy Davis for scale. And this is a small piece of the Murchison carbonaceous chondrite, which has all sorts of interesting objects in it, but that's for another time. The main point which you can think of right now is such rocks that fall out of the sky are essentially cosmic sediments. But not only that, the amazing thing is they are samples from the time the solar system looked like this, before the planets formed. These asteroids, of course, stuff happens in an asteroid for billions of years, but by and large, there's not a lot of geology that goes on. They're too small, too cold, all right? There's, there, that's a generalization, but let's go with that for now. So the standard model is that chondritic meteorites are relics from the solar nebula, and all the stuff that's in here was once around, floating around in space as, as they were creating together. And the best evidence for this kind of thing is this plot, which I borrowed from Professor Lauders and some friends, which shows uh, one of these carbonaceous chondrites, the CI class, and the relative abundance of a whole bunch of elements plotted against the abundance deduced for the solar photosphere from absorption lines in the sun's atmosphere. And the both plots are normalized such that silicon is a million on here. And this plot, uh, covers 13 orders of magnitude, all right? And what's a, what you see is that most of these elements are on this red line, which is the one-to-one -one line. So in this strange rock that fell in France in the middle of the 19th century, there, most of these elements have the same abundance, relative abundance as in the sun, okay? This is because they're from undifferentiated objects. Now, of course, there are big exceptions, right? The noble gases here, right? Well, noble gases don't make rocks. That's the reason that they're depleted in the rocks. Hydrogen, of course, most hydrogen is as H2, same reason. Lithium, you see, well, lithium is depleted in the sun and that's understood because it's, there are nuclear reactions as the sun is contracting to a main sequence star destroys the lithium. And you can actually use that to date stars to some extent. So, but otherwise it's pretty good, right? And, but there are some exceptions also, besides those obvious ones, a little bit more subtle ones are the very important elements, C and O. Very important because those are the major volatile elements and those are the elements involved, for example, in, in life. <laughs> and, uh, and, but you can see some interesting things. So for example, in the meteorites and certainly on the earth, nitrogen is depleted by a factor of 100, carbon by more than an order of magnitude and oxygen by some amount, right? And the reason is because some, these things stay in the volatile phase. Sure, they some of get into, the, into a refractory condensable phase making rocks, but some of it doesn't. And so that's an important, an important uh, consideration. And so the standard model basically, and this is basically how we know the composition of the earth, the bulk composition of the earth is we assume it's on this line. Right, that, that rocky planets are chondritic in the first approximation. That's always the first approximation. So chondritic means solar, right? Here's the proof. At this level of 10, 10%, 20%, whatever, except for these elements I've talked about. Now, what's often implicitly assumed with this, and there's very little empirical evidence for, and it, that's an interesting question, is that with a few exceptions, this is also assumed to be true for isotopic ratio. The reason is we don't know the isotopic ratios in the sun. You can't measure it in photospheric absorption lines, right? And so, so this is assumed to be the case and it's thought to be true to a pretty high level of precision. Now we know that there are exceptions and we'll talk about those a little bit later, but fundamentally what this allows us to do is to define what we would call a primordial homogeneous isotopic composition that we call solar. And then we can look for deviations from that isotopic composition and try to understand what the process is. In some cases, it's simple, it's radioactive decay, we understand how that works. In other cases, it's mass dependent fractionation, whether it's equilibrium or kinetic, we understand uh, very well how that works and so on. But then if you have deviations, that are not explicable in that way, they have to be assigned by default to a, some kind of 
uh, primordial heterogeneity that didn't get averaged out in that disk. And these are what we call isotope anomalies, all right? So, they, so, so that is a, a, a kind of working definition of isotope anomalies. We'll come back to that in just a second, because now I want to introduce some rocks. The beauty of rocks, rocks can remember their past, all right? Guess, so it was Don Brownlee who said, you know, solids remember, gases forget. It's an important thing. But anyway, rocks can remember, and if you're not asking the right question, they can tell you some things. So I showed this slide last night. This is a piece of the Allende carbonaceous chondrite. This uh, background is a blouse I borrowed from my wife for the picture. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Um, uh, I had ideas this might make the cover of science, but the editors had other ideas. <laughs> so... <laughs> But um, so this, this white thing here, this is an inclusion that formed in that nebula and it's a refractory inclusion that consists of basically ceramics of uh, oxides of uh, aluminum and calcium and some high temperature silicates and so forth. And they're also very interesting because these are the oldest datable rocks that we have in the solar system. We know they formed near the beginning of the solar system. That's another story, all right? But it, it's all related. But what I wanna focus on today is that they also are the, are the host for isotopic anomalies in, and including in the most important isotopic anomaly, which is in oxygen. So now we need to think about the element oxygen. And we need to think about it like a cosmochemist thinks about it. And I'm gonna, we'll consider the nuclear astrophysics, the chemistry of oxygen and, and, uh, and how the isotopes behave. So oxygen has three stable isotopes. Here are their rough abundances. The vast majority is oxygen-16. This is on the primary alpha path of nuclear synthesis. These are secondary nuclides, the 17 and 18, require some seed nuclei to, to be produced in stars. And so these are produced in different environments, all right? This is a part that you have, when you get a room full of geologists and geochemists, and I don't know how many of you are in, in, that, in that tribe, but um, you, know, you have to remind people that most of what we're standing on is oxygen. All right, there's the most abundant element in the earth by mole percent, which is the only thing that really matters in this kind of context. Um, but it's important chemistry, chemically, because oxygen not only bonds um, with you know, the silicon and magnesium and iron and all those things that make rocks, it also is in volatile species, the most important of which is carbon monoxide and water. All right, so you have the potential to separate gas from rock. And that's important in, in this whole story. And you have these anomalies that I'll show. And the anomalies, oxygen isotopes can spread out in a mass-dependent way and a mass-independent way. They can separate into different reservoirs. And if you're not familiar with these concepts, I'll show you in two slides with, or three slides what this means. So it's actually hard to find plots of such data. Here's a paper I got from, from Miller et al. 47 different rock samples. The x-axis is delta 18O. This is, the, this is a fractional difference in the oxygen 18-16 ratio expressed in parts per thousand from some standard. In this case, they used a laboratory gas standard, but if that, that's a detail, it doesn't matter. And here's the 17-16 ratio expressed in the same way. And what you can see here is these two things are highly correlated, right? So this is in fact, most of the time, terrestrial geochemists don't need to make the more difficult measurement of delta 17O. Why would you bother? If I, if I, if I measure delta 18O, I know delta 17O is 0.52 times delta 18O and I'm done, right? Now, we live in a world of high precision now. <laughs> um, wasn't always that way. <laughs> and there are some subtle differences in this mass-dependent behavior, which Fundamentally, this is due to the zero point energies and equilibrium reactions or kinetic energy, you know, uh, differences in, 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 uh, in, in kinetic processes, differences in, in reaction rates and so on. And you can start to see some slight differences in this review paper from Sharp et al. But this is all still mass dependent stuff. It makes one line, all right? And almost everything on the earth is on this line. We can talk later about a few things that aren't. So here comes then the greatest the problem from Chicago, the greatest discovery in meteorite science, in my opinion, is from Bob Clayton and colleagues who 
After the Allende meteorite fell, Larry Grossman took some bits, gave it to Bob, he gave it to Tosh Mehta, and they measured this. And Bob actually figured out how to do this. And, and the data look quite scattered now, but compared to what you'll see in a bit, but this was a huge discovery because this line here is equivalent to this terrestrial mass dependent fractionation line. And what they found out was that the bits in Allende, in particular, these calcium aluminum inclusions didn't fall on a slope half line, they fell on a slope one line and they went down by many tens of per mil down this line. So what does a slope one line mean on a plot like this? Well, if you extend this to, you know, and it goes, let's say to minus a thousand, minus a thousand, that's pure oxygen 16, right? So delta 18, delta 17, minus a thousand. It's as much as low as you can get. So what this means is that this is a, any, any line on here is a mixing between components. The earth is up here and they said, okay, so, the, so the, in this meteorite, we have an admixture of maybe a few percent of something that's very O16 rich, maybe even pure O16. And so they wrote their paper in science and you can see the title, The Component of Primitive Nuclear Composition in Carbonaceous Meteorites. So this was evidence for nuclear addition, right? An isotope anomaly that didn't get homogenized. And this was thought for a long time to be brought in by let's say supernova grains. And we used to call such deviations always nuclear effects, nuclear anomalies, because that was thought to be the only way to get off this half slope half line. Well, Mark Thiemens found a way to do that with just doing chemistry. And he did a beautifully simple experiment. He, pho he, he, he photolyzed some oxygen, produced ozone. And he said, hey, look, the product ozone is up here. The residual O2 is down here and this line is about slope one and you can just do chemistry in your lab and you can separate the isotopes or fractionate them same word in a mass independent way so this complicated things okay nobody knew what knows knew what this meant for the solar nebula because you don't have free oxygen gas around in the solar nebula it's too much hydrogen there then there's also a search that went on for many, many years, and I was part of it. And this was a big thing also here at WashU. And, uh, and the idea was to see if this oxygen anomaly would correlate with other anomalies that we knew were due to nucleosynthetic effects, nucleogenetic anomalies in things, in elements like this that made up these calcium aluminum rich inclusions. And this became, in my mind, I always like to call this the Nittler problem. All right, because Larry Nittler really put, put this uh, in everybody's face in a good way. Because by this point, pre solar grains had been found, right? Oxide rich grains had been found here. And, and here are some of them. And this is a plot from Larry. And what you can see here is the oxygen isotope composition, not in delta space anymore, because we're playing with pre solar grains. So we use a lot of log plot. Everything's great. And what you see though, this is the O16 rich quadrant and there's hardly anything down here, all right? So, so these supernova condensates, Don Clayton used to like to call these sunocons, which is a cool name. These things don't exist, basically. We looked for 30 years, didn't find them. Then we finally found the three solar grains and they're still not there, all right? So by the way, everything in the solar system, including what I'll be talking about today is about the size of the laser pointer there at the origin. So these are huge effects in pre-solar grains. I won't get into this, but I was involved in some of this. There are also O16 rich and O16 poor gases existing in the nebula. So how do you do that? From, you can't do that from uh, some stellar addition. So all of this together finally convinced the community and even convinced Bob Clayton that this is not right. This is not addition of, nuclear, of material which has a distinct nucleosynthetic history from the average stuff. There's something else going on here and chemistry rears its ugly head. Sorry for the chemists. Um, gets complicated, right? Moreover, even more fundamentally, we had another thing that's very bizarre to understand. Every time a meteorite fell on the earth, they would send it to Chicago, it would be measured and put another point on this plot and they were all over the place, right? So this actually became so diagnostic, it's a classification tool. It's one of the first things people do and you get a new meteorite to say, where is the plot in oxygen space? Now there's a much expanded scale from what I've been showing you. But here you see each chondrite group. If you look at those meteorites which come from objects which were melted, 
They form their own little slow path lines and they're also all over the place. So remember the earth is here, but the earth has no preferred position. Why should it, right? This is an old bias we have that Copernicus and Galileo helped us get rid of, right? So the same thing is true in isotope world. And, and but, the, but you know, the question is even, this even exists on a planetary scale. So here are meteorites we think come from Mars. We're pretty sure about that. Here's the earth and moon. Here are some meteorites that probably come from Vesta. See, they're different in this, in this uh, space. And you can't, you can't get from one line to another by normal physical chemical processes, all right? By some sort of chemical reaction or melting or vaporization, it doesn't work. So, but fundamentally what it means is that when we have this idea of a primordial composition for the most abundant elements that make rocky planets, you can't do it because everything we measure is somewhere else on this plot. There's no, there's no primor, there's no, you know, composition. How do you get it? And here's a clean up, cleaned up version of this with the CAIs showing the slope one line, sort of losing the battery here or something's rattling around. But anyway, you see that you have this problem and you don't know what's going on here. This is the, this is the bulk silicate earth, this point here. That's the mantle of the earth. So are we adding O16 rich stuff, right? Does the solar system start somewhere near here and we add some exotic material where we do some, some weird chemistry and come down this way? Or maybe we start here and we do some, something and we come up this way. Which way is it? You don't know. You know where you ended up because you can measure it. And the idea is if you knew where you started, then maybe you could figure this out or figure it out a little better, let's say. So knowledge of the starting composition is, under, is really key for knowing the process. So where do you get the starting composition? How do you know the average of the solar nebula, which doesn't exist anymore? Well, yeah, it kind of does. The sun is everything, right? And if you didn't think the sun was big, that's the, that's the lunar orbit for scale. <laughs> All right, so the sun has to be equal to the average, just by mass balance, right? So then the question is, okay, well, how do you get a piece of the sun? So for the young people here, the rocket for this mission was launched in the latter days of the George W. Bush administration. And of course, there are people in government who are concerned about waste, fraud, and abuse, and wasting of taxpayers' money in science. And they knew, how do you go and get the sun, right? How do you send a spacecraft to the sun? Surface is 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius, 10,000 Fahrenheit. It's gonna melt, right? So, so Don Burnett, who's the PI of the mission, was called to answer for this. And he said, oh, it's okay. It's, we thought about that. We'll just go at night. <laughs> okay, so the joke still works. All right, so obviously you don't go to the sun. You let the sun come to you. Right, the solar atmosphere is hot enough that it blows off the wind, the solar wind, and you collect the solar wind. And so that's the Genesis mission from a JPL flight plan perspective. It's quite easy. You launch from the earth, you have to get outside the magnetosphere. Here's the lunar orbit. So you cruise toward L1. And here you can execute these halo orbits expending very little energy. And you can go around the sun for two years with the Earth at L1, orbiting around, staring at the sun, collecting the wind. That's what was done. Then after your exposure time, you close up your collector, you do a loop around L2 so that you can come back to the Earth um, in the daytime over Utah, um, where there's a good place to land. And what do you, well, how do you collect solar wind? Well, you get the purest materials that we know how to make. And here, you know, mostly semiconductor materials. This is in the clean room at JSC. And, uh, and then, you, you know, the solar wind has an energy of about 1 keV per mu, which is enough to, if it encounters a solid object to penetrate slightly and get stuck there. All right, so that's, that's the idea. Here's how it looked. Uh, you have, you collect the bulk solar wind. You also want to collect solar wind from different speed regimes so you can deploy these different uh, platters to do that. But what we're mostly concerned about is this thing called the concentrator which as it says out here was dedicated to increase the concentration so that you could more easily measure the very important gases that I alluded to at the beginning, oxygen and nitrogen, which after all is most of what we're breathing now. And there's just a lot of contamination on this planet with those elements, right? So how does this work? It's an electrostatic mirror. 
you have a backward facing target. Here's what it looked like. And solar wind ions come in here. You put a potential on this parabolic surface here. You turn them around, give them an additional kick so they go in a little deeper and you focus them on this target, which consists of two wedges of silicon carbide, single crystal silicon carbide, the purest material I've ever seen, and some uh, chemically vapor deposited diamond film, one of which was pure carbon 13, and we don't need to talk about that too much anymore. Uh, we can later if you want. And just for scale, this is six centimeters. So the idea is basically you take solar wind that would impinge on a large area, and you focus it down to a smaller target, therefore, thereby increasing its concentration. Um, uh, but there's a problem, right? So people who do work on laboratory instruments will recognize immediately this is an optical device. First of all, the concentration is not gonna be uniform across the target, but more importantly, uh, in some ways, um, is that you're gonna get isotope fractionation across the target as a function of radial position in the target. And so you need to deal with that. And, uh, and there are ways to do that. So just to show you, this is, this is in the uh, high bay before launch. This is how it would have looked at L1, right? With everything open and deployed. Um, then the, the, the part that's gonna come back to earth, the sample return capsule is here. Here's some people for scale. And you know, it's a small spacecraft. Again, here's half a person for scale. And this is the nice white ablation shield of the thing. And of course you have all the power you want because you're staring at the sun, right? So it's not too complicated. There was a flawless launch, which I missed, but that's another story and a rather inelegant return. This is what was supposed to happen. We had a Hollywood stunt pilot who was gonna catch up to this and snag it with a big hook. When I first heard this, I was like, you must be kidding me. <laughs> but I've seen movies, he would have done it. All right, but he didn't quite get the chance. And so the question is, when you assemble a spacecraft, there are thousands of parts. And you put them all together and then you have a part like this, which is called an accelerometer and it has a wire coming out this end and a wire going out that end. Does it matter which way you put the wires in? Yeah, it matters. <laughs> okay, so this is what happens if you drop your experiment from the top of the atmosphere. All right, it looks like it's a penetrated into the earth, but no, it's pretty much just truncated there. And our friend here, I've, I've never met this guy and I have to ask him, why are you smiling so much? <laughs> but he was smiling, all right? And you know, we got the sample back, all right? So, so Don Burnett, the PI said it best. He said, you know, if you're going to crash into a planet, earth is the best one. You crash into Mars, you're done, all right? You crash into Earth, you can pick up the pieces. And so that's what they did. We had a lot more pieces than we started with, but we were lucky, all right? And the concentrator, in particular, the silicon carbide target survived. Uh, and silicon carbide, just pretty tough stuff. They were nicked up and dirtied, but that's okay. We got them and we got the solar wind. So, okay, now we get a little bit into the analysis. I don't, I'm not gonna get into that too much. And especially because I'm, getting a little long-winded here, but let's just say this is a difficult measurement. This was what we knew, what we were expecting was a profile because there's a, there's a range of energies, right? Of the implant implantation of oxygen for the solar wind. Notice the depth scale here is in angstroms and this is a relative distribution. We expect something like 10, three times 10 to the 14 per square centimeter. And that equates at the top here to about 100 ppm atomic, all right? Charge, okay. So that's a good timing because we're about to get the rousing uh, you know, results here in a moment. All right, so I had one of the best mass spectrometers in the world at that time, and I knew that we couldn't make the measurement with that one. And there's a lot of problems analytically here. And basically, SIMS, secondary ion mass spectrometry, can solve a lot of the problems. It, it can have good enough depth resolution. It can image dust particles. Some of this is just, you know, it's a surface sensitive technique. So you need a very good vacuum. You need to be able to measure these isotopes. And you need one of the bigger problems, however, is that most of what we would collect was hydrogen because that's what the sun is, right? So you try to remove that, but you're going to have a problem with O16H at mass 17. And it's going to be much, much bigger even though you've tried your best to get rid of it, you can't help it because that's what you're collecting. And so you got to get rid of this and there are ways to do it. You can use high mass resolution, but that costs you sensitivity. 
And <clears throat> Brad alluded to this at the time, all my friends were getting nano sims. Sounds great. And I was like, okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna go with a, with a brute physics approach. We're gonna go to higher energies. We're gonna bust up the molecules and we're gonna do this at a million volts. And it's not gonna be a nano sim, it's gonna be a mega sims because after all, we have a million volts, right? So that's what we built. Um, I don't think I wanna take the time to get into this, but basically the idea is you, you have a, you have a, uh, uh, a SIMS. This is a, a Kamika 6F, so people here are familiar with this. And then you replace the back end with, uh, with a, a tandem accelerator where you destroy the molecules. And now the problem is coming out, the end of this is you have only atomic ions, but they're at high energy. And so you need a big mass spectrometer. And this is a very classical, this is right out of 1930s literature. It's just big. You don't have to have it at high mass resolution anymore and you can have high sensitivity. So these are some of the features for Genesis that, uh, that work. We have to do simultaneous collection. We know how to do that. We have to destroy the molecules. We have to have an ion microscope to avoid dust and dirt. We can do that. And we have to do it at high sensitivity. And uh, okay, do I really wanna get if people were interested in the instrument, I'm happy to talk for a long time about all this, but basically let me just say, you can get half of the oxygen through this instrument with no OH, right? So that was an advantage. If you couldn't do that, then what's the point, right? You're just playing around with big instruments. But uh, anyhow, so we put this thing together and it worked uh, for at least long enough to do the measurements. And here's how it looked when the lab was clean, doesn't look that nice now. Um, the real issue for us really was still the blank. It's incredibly hard to get oxygen out of vacuum systems, but we managed to do it again by brute force um, and, and with the help of a cryo pump, which is part of our brute force. And eventually we got down to the point where of course you have some surface oxide and um, there we go. And, but we could implant some oxygen 18 and we could make estimates on this. And in fact, we could see that we could get our, our noise down to less than 2% of the expected signal. We said, okay, that's good, let's go. So we did, and here's the solar wind. All right, so we get a robust, so here's the silicon carbide being loaded in, and you see the three oxygen isotopes. We would go sputter through, through the, uh, through the solar wind. We'd clean the surface a little and lose a little bit sputter through until we got to a steady background that we could subtract off. And the rest of the integral was the solar, was due from the solar wind, from the sun. All right, so you add it all up and you can make a ratio, but of course it's fractionated in the concentrator. And so we made a bunch of measurements as a function of radial distance in this wedge of the concentrator. And, you know, and I'll show you some of those here. So here's in fact, a a view of this, sort of this point here, A is near the apex here. And as you go out, the concentration is going down, right? And at some point it gets so low that it's, you get very big errors. But we're able to measure this um, for the oxygen isotopes. We do these depth profiles, which you can see here. This is the ion probe. And this is a laser measurement of the noble gas ratios made by Veronica, Eber, and Zurich. And this was key. All right, because we can use the, the fact that we can, we can directly calibrate the mass fractionation in the concentrator. And let me show you. So here's the result of the oxygen. If we average those profiles from all of those areas, uh, here's the terrestrial fractionation line. Notice the scale went way down in negative territory in both delta 18 and delta 17. And the data are spreading out. I've put a dotted line in here of slow path to help guide the eye. Of course, the errors are much bigger. You can't, you can't definitively say that that's a slow path, but it fits that. And the question is, how do you correct for the mass fractionation? And here, neon comes to the rescue, right? So this is something some of you know very well, and terrestrial geochemists don't think about this. Neon's the fifth most abundant element in the galaxy, all right? And it's abundant enough, and there's no background. So you can measure it in the bulk concentrate, in the bulk, Genesis collector and in, in the concentrator in small areas and that you saw those pits, right? So that you can use that to correct the mass fractionation. And here's how the neon data look. And this is again from one of Veronica's papers. There's the dotted line is the bulk solar wind. And, 
And of course, the concentration and the isotope ratio is varying uh, along radial distance in the concentrate. All right, that's fine. And it's a lot, 34 per mil per AMU from the max to the min, all right? And all the noble gases are doing this. The argon is not really fully concentrated. The thing wasn't designed to get up to that high mass, but here's helium and neon. And the question is, can you make a model of this thing that works sufficiently? Um, and the short answer is yes, because oxygen 1816 is not that far off from neon 22 to 20. And you can, you, you know, you can, you can uh, make a correction so that you can use the neon data to correct the oxygen. And so schematically, this is what the neon data look like in delta values across the concentrator. Here's the oxygen data just in delta 18 in this point. And basically you correct this down to the bulk. You have a corresponding correction for the oxygen and the 1617 correction is, is uh, mass dependent from that. So it's half roughly. So the upshot is when you do this, these points that spread out all collapse, especially the ones with the, that are, are uh, in the interior where you have higher concentrations and they all agree in the average with a, a composition here, which is at about minus 100, minus 80 in Delta 18, Delta 17 space. Is this the photosphere? We don't think so. All right, so this now, everything I've told you up to now is empirical measurement. Now, what I'm gonna say is a hypothesis. I'm allowed to do that, right? And, and so we don't think so because nothing else, there have been thousands of measurements of oxygen in, in, in solar system objects, nothing's over here. And more importantly, it's expected that the solar wind is mass fractionated in its acceleration from the photosphere outward. All right, and there are various models for that and there are measurements and they both more or less agree that the solar wind should be mass fractionated on a slow path line on, on the order of like, what is this? This is about 20 something per mil, 22, 23 per mil per AMU. And if you come over here, there's a few per mil uncertainty, but here's this other line. So you have two lines on a graph. I was taught you might as well look at the intersection. And this is our hypothesis that the sun should be at about minus 60 in both of these coordinates. Could be wrong by a couple per mil, but not much, all right, beyond that. And so we published this, and this is kind of the whole map of the solar system oxygen isotope composition. Here's the Earth, here are the CAI objects. Don't worry about fun. Here's, here's the solar wind that we measured. Here's where we think the sun is. So this is the average, not the planetary composition. All right. And moreover, there's heavy water that now you have to look at the insert that goes way up this line by another 200 per mil. I'll come back to that in just a moment. But let's just summarize where we're at so far. All right. So despite what you may have seen in the press, all right, about Genesis crashing, it worked. All right. That's the fundamental first order thing you should know. The measurement worked. Here's what we think we got. Delta 18, delta 17, about minus 59 per mil. And this is about six to 7%, 60 to 70 per mil, uh, means that the earth, bulk meteorites and so on, are enriched in the minor heavy isotopes by about that much compared to solar, all right? It implies that, you know, the number of atoms involved in this anomaly is not just in these little weird CAI objects in some media, minor class of meteorites, right? It's like half the inner solar system. So it's a big deal. And Bob Clayton put that best. I actually wrote this down at an LPSC meeting. I wrote this in my little, that little pamphlet they give you. And he said, uh, CAIs are not anomalous, you are. All right, so that sums it up very well. You know, that's full circle from where he was, you know, a few decades before that, he said that. So is it right? Well, that's always a good question to ask. And um, recently, Jim Lyons and some colleagues uh, took some old data actually from a high resolution uh, spectrograph that flew on, on the space shuttle and uh, had some new, uh, new um, uh, parameters for, for the uh, uh, absorption line strengths. And they, they, you can observe some row vibrational lines of CO in the solar atmosphere. 
and they they made a model and deduced it's it's a little bit complicated into the spectrometry but they deduced the carbon and the oxygen composition of this of the co the delta 18 measurement you need to do both right the delta 18 measurement is pretty good delta 17 has big errors because the abundances are five times lower but they get minus 50 plus or minus 11 per mil and the point would be here right and so our Genesis point is is here. So the important point is, you know, of course, there's big errors and so on, but it's not here, right? And so we think it's right. By the way, uh, uh, another group um, in uh, in Nancy, uh, Bernard Marti, Mark Chosidon, and others, um, Roger Weens, I neglected to mention, Roger built, right, Roger's team at Los Alamos built the concentrator. This would not have worked without that. And <clears throat> they measured the nitrogen isotopes. And nitrogen, the standard for nitrogen is air, all right? And so the nitrogen in the sun is 40% off from what we're breathing, which is huge, right? So again, isotopically light. If you do some corrections for the acceleration, maybe some gravitational settling, these are model dependent, doesn't matter. It's still minus 380 uh, per mil. All right, so, so the Earth's nitrogen is very, very heavy compared to the average. And that was consistent with the Jovian value. So here's the upshot. We come back to this plot. This is the sort of standard model plot, right? And the standard model is not correct for the isotopes of, the, of these important volatile elements, abundant important volatile elements. So <clears throat> it's also, I should say, we know that it's not correct for other refractory elements that are minor abundance. You have small anomalies in titanium and chromium and, and molybdenum and, and, and tungsten and all kinds of things. Okay, but this is small heterogeneities that were not mixed in. When I say small, you know, we're talking there where measurements are made in PPM kind of accuracies or tens of PPM, let's say, right? This is the oxygen story is 200 per mil. Let's look a little bit now into this issue of the origin of this. How am I doing on time? We've got a, well, well, I'm getting there. I only have a few more slides. All right, in a general way, if you think about what this means, right? It's not a nucleosynthetic effect. So what, how would you characterize this? Well, you could think that there's some inheritance, meaning it comes into the disk in some way, or it's something you make locally. Those are the two sort of end members. These were the original ideas about nucleosynthesis. They're not right. So maybe in the molecular cloud, you had some uh, way of fractionating in a non-mass dependent way, the oxygen isotopes, either from self-shielding of CO, which is an abundant molecule, or reactions on cold grain surfaces or some other mechanisms that need to be explored. In the disk, you could also, you could have Mark Thiemann's kind of like chemistry going on that needs to be specified. Um, and, and, uh, and again, you can have isotopic self-shielding of CO. So that's one of the most, I would say, standard explanations, just briefly, what is it? Well, CO is a very stable molecule. Bob Clayton came to, to view it this way. Um, the idea is that you can, you can dissociate this molecule if you have UV photons in the right energy range. And if you liberate this oxygen, right, and the reaction network is much more complicated than this, but in the first approximation, it's in a, it's in a sea of hydrogen. So you have reactive oxygen, a sea of hydrogen, what do you do to make water? What's an important property of water? Well, if it's cold enough, you can freeze it out. So you have a way of separating it from the gas, make it a solid, right? And so what's interesting about this, so what's the self-shielding part? Well, let's say you have some source of photons and it, you know, it, it initially there's enough photons to, 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 to not care about the isotopologs here and, and dissociate C16O, C17O, C18O. But, you know, if you've got enough column of gas relative to the photons when the optical depth gets deep enough, then the CO, 16O, those are photons that will excite those lines are gone. All right, so that stays behind in the CO, whereas this, the 18 and the 17 can get liberated and therefore get stuck in the water. All right, so this is, 
a unidirectional kind of thing. This capital Delta 17 means that the water is gonna be very heavy up, up this line. And is it? So I come back to the heavy water and the answer is yes. So this was discovered in a strange meteorite called Aqua um, uh, 094. And uh, this is from uh, uh, Yurimoto's group, Sakamoto et al. And here, everything we've been talking about is down here. They found some of this stuff in, the, in there, which is they eventually got called cosmic symplectite, which is some very intimate mixture of magnetite and pentlandite, so oxide and sulfide. And um, you know, here's a 200 nanometer scale. And the interpretation is that this stuff was due to a reaction with ices with the fine grain material that was in the meteorite. And so you're, you're kind of trapping that volatile material into these solids now. And when they measure this, it's way up here. It's isotopically heavy, right? 150 to 200 per mil. That must mean I'm done almost. But since we had technical issues, I'm going to ask for two more minutes. <laughs> okay, because so this is very this is what you expect by the self shielding. It's very important, and um, you know the question is where could that occur? And uh, so you know there's a lot of UV in star forming regions. Orion will be up must be up soon, right? It's winter, um, and massive stars are pumping out all this ultraviolet. And there was a very exciting paper published uh, just like a month ago or something, right? Right? No, I don't know. Uh, from, from right here, um, from Ryan Ogliori, uh, Vacher, and others. And looking in, in here, they found more of this cosmic symplectite, which is great because for 10 years, no one else had published anything else on it. And we produced very, you know, exactly this heavy water composition. So here's the delta 18, delta 17. Here's the sun. So we have 250 per mil of variability along this line. And importantly, had the idea also, this has got sulfide, let's measure the sulfur isotopes. And the sulfur isotopes are also not mass dependently fractionated. They're mass independently fractionated. They're not on this mass dependent fractionation line, delta 36 and delta 33 plotted against delta 34. So, um, 32 sulfur being the major isotope of sulfur. And so then one can uh, think about what this means and, and look at the radiation fields of massive stars. And I think Ryan probably talked about this fairly recently here. So I'm not gonna go into, you can ask him about the details, but the radiation field of massive stars compared to what you expect from a protostar would imply that this kind of thing would make the sulfur anomalies here um, in an interstellar molecular cloud environment rather than in a protostellar disk. And so that, you know, I'm sure this will be followed up in, in more detail. We have to find more of this. We have to find more of it and not in this one weird meteorite, but who knows, that could be hard. Um, and this is very exciting stuff. And I think it shows that there's a region where you can do self-shielding of CO and of H2S and, and make some exotic ices, which if they get into the right environment in the early solar system can be preserved and you can see that. So to conclude, I talked about the oxygen isotopes. Um, I didn't talk too much about this, but I think this part is important. The interaction with heavy water in this cosmic symplectite can generate the mixing line. And the key to that is gas dust fractionation as well. And what we really need, what we would like to see, okay, these are very hard measurements and very small bits of, of a meteorite. What we would love to do is to go out and get a chunk of a comet, you know, that we could fill a thermos like that full of, so we can measure the ices in the outer solar system. And we should see things like ices that are derived from CO type things. It would be isotopically in disequilibrium with water ices if, if this stuff is right. And so what we really need is a comet nucleus sample return mission. I'll plug that for the young people here and uh, please pursue that and, uh, and, and tell me what you find when you get that. So, so um, of course it takes a lot, it takes a team to do all this stuff. And these are people who, who helped make this uh, design and build this. And also uh, Don Burnett, the PI of the mission, Roger Weens who made the concentrator and so on. And um, so thank you for your attention. I found this 
old picture here, which I like very much. The, the Max Center family, it's good to be back. So thanks. Old picture of Kevin, but I decided not to show it. He showed it himself, so that's good. Okay, <laughs> yes. Um, we have a, we have plenty of time for questions and answers. And for those who are uh, joining us online, let me ask that you put questions into the chat or the Q and A, and we'll get to them. But we'll start first with some questions from the audience here. Uh, so, questions, questions for the speaker. Bill, go for it, Bill. Your last point, you want to get a common sample? If we got a, a sample of and the plume gas water. Hold on a second, Bill. Oh, sorry. For the benefit of those. Yeah, sure. Um, sometimes it's hard to convince convince people to get these sort of primordial samples. But if you, other people want to get a sample of Enceladus, the water from Enceladus, now would that also give you the answer? That you it would at least give you a partial answer. And, and, um, because we expect it to get water. I would really love to see ices and see those ices derived from, from the CO chain of whatever kind of you know chemical network is going on to see if it's different from the solids. You know, in a comet, things should really be so cold that they have no chance of, of isotopically reequilibrating. Maybe that's wrong. That's an assumption. However, having said that, I would love to see water from the Celsius or any, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, this would be, and, and, and there's other motivations for going there, you know, that's the biological, you know, interest, and it's much more possible, perhaps. Um, so that would be a, a really cool uh, mission. I encourage you to go for it. <laughs> um, and we would expect it to be isotopically heavy. And the key point is we have basically almost nothing. That think that we think formed outside a snow line where we know the ice built composition of. Right? The, the mic is gone, but maybe you can repeat for people. So something that, that might be more feasible in the near term is a sample return from series. So people ah, have proposed that to the day. Yes. I don't know. I don't know what series is. That it's all good stuff, right? So let me let me just say series is your thing. I'm not gonna, you know, I, I'm all in favor of that. But clearly, Ceres has got internal heat processes going on. It's got these uh, materials coming out, that, you know, in some kind of volcanism, if you will. Yeah. Right. Um, other questions? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So when you yeah. so when you talked about. Um, Correcting the genesis value and like putting it towards the inferred solar composition because of Excel. That's because of uh, fractionation on the surface of the sun or in the acceleration of the solar wind. Right. So can that be like calculated or experimentally simulated or some, something? I mean, that is a great question. And it can be calculated. And there's some clever people doing this. And I follow some of the calculations. And the question then is I'm basically an empiricist. So how do you test this, right? And there's a way to test it, but we haven't done it yet. And I think the way to test it is by looking at magnesium. And why? Because magnesium has three isotopes, and we think magnesium is in all of the all of the extraterrestrial samples we have. Magnesium is always the same, so it should show a large fractionation in the solar wind. But we haven't been able to measure that yet. The competing ideas on this, there's uh, there's large fractionations in the, in the in the proton to alpha ratio from the solar wind. The sun is a complicated thing, right? And um, people have come up with models where heavy ions are dragged by the proton. So this is some inefficient Coulomb drag kind of model, and that works in this in the sense. And then there's another model which has to do with waves in the sun and these in these sort of coupled footprints magnetic footprints that come into the sun and then um, how the solar wind can get released from these magnetic flux tubes. And that one, gotta say, I don't fully understand all the, how, how the isotopes work 
in, in that kind of model. This is Martin Lamming at the Naval Research Lab, who's the expert in this ponder motive force. And but then he needs some other it looked to me like adjustment factors <laughs> to get the isotope fractionation right. But that's very important, not just for the isotopes. And the isotopes will be will be very useful for sussing out the physics of what's going on in, in this, if we can really nail it down. And that's extremely important because when you want to get elemental compositions, now we know there are big effects having to do with first ionization potential relative to hydrogen and so on. And so we know we have large fractionations, like tens of percent factor of two almost between elements. And if we want to get the elemental composition, we need to have a physical model to correct for that. And in the first approximation, it's getting enough reliable data to really construct such a model with some kind of robustness, right? That's that's what we would, we would like to do. And so we're still working on that. Um, and as a point I made last night, the beauty about sample return, right? Even if you don't do it very well, like in this case, um, then, you know, samples are here on Earth. Experimental techniques get better. Young people are smarter than old people. And there will be somebody coming along that will figure out how to do all of these things, hopefully, or fly another Genesis mission. Or when you go to the moon, leave a collector out. Wouldn't it be great if, you know, there were collectors out there for the last 50 years and we could have 25 years of daylight. And there'd be other stuff on the moon. It's a complicated place, too. There'd be other stuff there, but that would be cool. And we'd go back and pick up some of the hardware that was left. We talked about this the other day. Well, the, I guess the solar wind collector on 11 was brought back. But yeah, if after if two, day, had, two, two days, two two days, not even. If one had stayed there, if we could have the foresight to say we will go back there at some point. Yes, yes, yes. But you know that was great for noble gases. But you know noble gases are awesome because they're not a contamination problem. So, so Kevin, just to follow up on the last question, since oxygen has this fractionation relationship back to the one one line mm -hmm. that you interpret as coming from the surface of the sun. Does that mean that the neon, both neon numbers that you showed are also not reflected in our- Ah, good point. Yes. So, so the, again, the noble gases probably come to the rescue because it's abundant enough to even measure in the regime samples. And so there are, you know, it, it actually fits with expectations of the model, you can measure fast solar wind, slow solar wind, see the fractionation going in at least the right sense with the right magnitude. I don't think I have a plot to show you on that, but this is uh, if it, um, um, Veronica Aber's work published in a couple of different places in the last decade or so on that. And there may be some updates on that. Looking at the light noble gases, right? The heavy ones are another issue altogether. And you wouldn't expect as much fractionation anyway. And you can't use helium because helium is too complicated because three, four, it's a, there's all these magnetic fields around. So it's really neon is the best. Argon a little bit. Other questions? Anything on chat? Nothing, nothing okay. on the line. So that's good. Well, uh, we'll Oops, take this start one. Oh, I just have one. Okay. All right. From uh, Lee Subarka, are there any molecules other than CO that are abundant enough to self heal? Basically, spectral hole burning for abundant isotopes. That's CN. The logic is clear for diatomics. Can it happen for multi atomics? Can be true. Wow. Good questions. Uh, I think, uh, you know, various um, silicon bearing species could fit that. What do you think, Brian? Other. Well, people talk about nitrogen too, yeah. right? Nitrogen is, is a key one that have narrow lines and well space. Right. It could it could work. The nitrogen, the issue is you have only two isotopes, you get one ratio. You can't tell non-mass dependent from mass dependent, but you have such a huge effect. It has to be something like that. Yes. Maybe SIO that nobody has thought about. SIO, SIO, certainly, maybe not with a self-shielding way, but some other. Interesting chemistry on drain surfaces uh, can can be something that could happen with SIO. Um, basically, for this to really work, you need something that's abundant. 
also, right? If it's something too exotic that can explain, this is the major isotopic feature of the inner solar system at least. Such a huge effect, right? Um, if you saw this kind of thing in a, in a, in a grain, you would call it pre-solar grains. I mean, you know, it's 250 per mil. I mean, you know, but, but it's not. If you see it in asteroids and planets, right? So it can't be that. Okay, well, I didn't know if I answered all the parts of that, but we got most of them in uh, with some help from my friends. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to Lee for a, a good question. Yes. Always good questions from Lee. Okay, any other questions? So I have a quick one. Oh, yes. Which is not good for me. Um, is there any chance for uh, collecting material from Mars that you could look at it? Would you expect it to be different from Earth? Okay, so we know. Okay, well, we know. We think we know. <laughs> I used to be a skeptic because we're all trained that way initially. I'm 99 point something percent sure we have rocks from Mars, right? And they are different from the rocks from Earth. By, by a small offset in those horizontal lines, 0.3 per mil, not a lot, but still uh, highly significant. And, you know, I should emphasize that fundamentally, no one really knows why the planet, all the planetary materials have this different oxygen isotop comp compositions, which are, you know, unique. So why do I say, you know, so as soon as we get samples back from Mars, the first thing that will happen, all right, we'll see if there's anything crawling around in them. The second thing that will happen <laughs> is that somebody will measure the oxygen isotopes with high precision, and then we will say, okay, all these SNC meteorites that we've been saying come from Mars really do, and they will be linked definitively to Mars in the same way we can link some meteorites definitively to the moon because we have lunar rocks, right? So, so that is a, a first order thing uh, to do. But fundamentally, we don't really know why this, why this is happening because it's complex mixing processes having to do with dust and gas ratios and fluxes in and out and when and where the stuff of the planets, it, where, where the, the feeding zones are, right? And so there's a lot to be still learned about that. Um, and getting samples from the outer solar system would be really a big step in, in that in that process. Kevin, along those lines, um, the, the, some of the recent data coming from HED meteorites suggested perhaps there's a little deviation from that um, line for best best okay. areas. What what's your take on that? What, have any idea um, what that? I, I, I have to see. I don't really know uh, what uh, um, what could it be. Well. Uh, you'd have to make sure these aren't wretches. I mean, you know, there's mixing and that goes on, but I, I, I guess I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, but that that means, some, some of the variation is because there's also carbonaceous material on the surface of Vesta. Obviously. Right, so, so there's a mixing. So how yeah. there's a mixing, but it, there's also been some speculation that maybe there's more than one, there, you know, there are Vestoids, and maybe there's more yes. than one parent body for Yes, I think that's that's also eminently possible, right? Because of the rest of it. And, and then John Watson used to argue, because John liked to argue, but also <laughs> with, with, with good reason um, in some cases about, you know, that uh, as a contrarian that maybe the HEDs aren't all from Vesta, but from other Vesta-like objects. And there were arguments about how close you are to some resonance in the asteroid belt that are providing these pathways Basically, increasing increasing the eccentricity of orbits if you're in some resonance with Jupiter or even Saturn or you know so on. So, but yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, you know, these these rocks come to us. They're, as I said last night, there are sixty some odd thousand of them. They don't come with little made-in labels, so we don't know. This is the big problem compared to geochemistry, where you can go to an outcrop and at least. Knock off a chunk. We don't know where some of these things are coming from. We have ideas, but we don't fundamentally. Okay, last call for questions. If not, um, Kevin, you've given us a very informative but also very interesting and entertaining <laughs> presentation. And we want to thank you again for a uh, great lecture. Well, thanks for having me.